Good morning. It's already time for our lecture. I will begin by a small correction of the previous lecture. Namely, when looking at the slides I have shown you, I noticed that there is a small mistake on one of the slides. It was slide number 91. Just a second. So on slide 91, uh, the dimension of the coefficient here, 8 pi g over c to the power of 4, was unfortunately wrong in a rather simple way. The version of the slides which I uploaded to the web page is already corrected, but just for the sake of, of your understanding, let me just mention that there was a mistake over here. A rather simple one, just calculated the dimension in, in the wrong way. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, so the plan for today is that we will discuss the third problem sheet first. And then we'll move on with the linearization of the Einstein equations and what kind of physical conclusions you can um, actually draw from that. So let me share my screen. Uh, we'll begin with the Blackboard lecture. So this is the problem sheet three. Uh, did you find it difficult or not? So most people... The first one was pretty straightforward. The, the second one was more challenging, I think. I see. So you found the second one a bit more difficult. Okay. Uh, okay, well, we can begin with the second problem. So if you recall, the idea of the second problem was to complete the proof we were discussing on the... So this is problem number two. So we were supposed to complete the proof that the formula over here, gamma mu alpha beta equals to the inverse metric times the combination of derivatives over here. So it's a minus g alpha beta mu. Uh, that this gives indeed the only metric torsion-free connection. So proof is metric torsion-free. Uh, so the torsion-free part is rather simple. We are just supposed to show that this is asymmetric uh, object in the two lower indices. And that's pretty straightforward to see because, well, uh, it's easy to see that gamma mu alpha beta, uh, I don't have to write it actually. You see, this term and this term, they're not symmetric by itself, but, but they differ exactly by a different positions of alpha and beta. So taken as a sum together, they're symmetric with respect to the exchange of alpha with beta. And the third term is symmetric with respect to the exchange of alpha beta anyway, because the metric is symmetric. So this is kind of simple. It takes a little bit more time to prove that the metric tensor uh, has a vanishing covariant derivative, but it's also not so terribly hard. So we just have to write the formula for the covariant derivative. V sigma nu minus gamma sigma uh, nu alpha g nu sigma. And now we just have to substitute the uh, formula for the um, Christopher symbols. Let kappa be this summation index in the Christopher symbols formula. So this is gamma kappa mu alpha plus G kappa alpha mu minus G uh, 
mu alpha kappa. And the same thing for nu. Oh, and here we need to write gamma sigma nu. And here we get the same thing. Alpha nu minus nu alpha. And this is, oh, sorry, forgot again. This is multiplied by G mu sigma. All right. Uh, so the next step is. Uh, can I ask something? Yes. So the thing is that if we stay uh, gamma is torsion free uh, and at the same time, G mu nu is equals to zero, then we like, if we write the inverse, because I think so, I wrote the inverse, um, where we say that it has g mu nu equals to uh, the derivative of g mu nu equals to zero, and gamma of mu alpha beta equals to gamma of mu beta alpha, mm -hmm. then we get the Christoffel symbols equation as what is given. Is this also true? Yes, yes, but here I just a second. Then it seems that these things have disappeared. I don't know why. Uh, so what is going on? Okay, somehow my calculations have disappeared and I have no idea why. Uh, I'm really sorry, I don't know what has happened. So let me write again. Uh, so what we have proved on the blackboard uh, is that if we assume that the metric is uh, is uh, that the gamma is uh, torsion free and metric, then it must have the uh, form I have written above. Mm, here is the answer. I'm again sorry, awfully sorry. I don't know what happened, but somehow everything disappeared and I cannot take it back. So mm -hmm. let me write it again. But that's a different thing than proving uh, than proving the converse statement. So we have already proved that if G, uh, if the connection is metric, so we have G alpha beta covariant derivative mu equal to zero and this thing over here, then we need to have that. But we have not proved that this formula indeed satisfies the condition we have uh, imposed at first place. Uh, keep in mind that in the derivation we have we have made a bit of a clever trick involving summing the same equation over and over again with slightly displaced indices. Uh, in that case, uh, in at least one part of of the derivation, we only have formally uh we can only conclude that uh we can only make a conclusion one way so we know that if this is true then gamma has to be given by this formula here but we haven't strictly speaking proved that if gamma is given by this formula above then indeed this is satisfied you see the reasoning I have presented to you gives you only a one way, gives you only the reasoning one way. From these conditions, you end up with this formula over here. But it's not clear that if you assume this formula over here, you'll indeed recover what is here. Uh, logically, it could happen that simply this condition does not offer any solutions whatsoever. We obtain this formula, but then find out that somehow it fails to satisfy some of these conditions. It turns out that this is not the case, but we have to check that. Uh, is it uh, okay. more clear? Is yes. it clear? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Okay, so the only difficult part is again to show that G mu nu covariant alpha, which is equal to G mu nu alpha minus uh, gamma sigma 
nu alpha g sigma nu minus g gamma sigma nu alpha g nu sigma, that this is equal to zero. And look, this is just the question of uh, relatively straightforward tensile algebra. So let's do it quickly. So in this, so we are lowering this, this metric tensor will lower the index over here, but this index has been, is, is raised previously in this formula above. So this and this will produce an appropriate delta term, and we can already write it here. Uh, we'll have new here, and let's say kappa here. And over there, we need uh, kappa mu alpha plus plus g kappa alpha mu minus g mu alpha kappa. And this comes exactly from contracting this lower index metric with the metric which appears in the Christoffel symbols. And we've got the same thing. Uh, I work this, the same with new and new exchanged. Because you see, it's easy to see that these two terms differ only by the position of new and new. Okay, strictly speaking, also the position within the metric is different, but the metric is symmetric. So you can obtain this guy just by exchanging, by, by swapping the indices mu and new over here. And that's what I'm writing here. Okay, so this is minus half g mu mu alpha plus g. Uh, I substitute kappa with mu again, minus g mu alpha mu. And then I've got another term from this thing over here. And I get it just by swapping the indices, mu and mu. Okay, and now it's just a question of recognizing the same terms. So we've got this term over here and also appears over here with a slightly different order of mu and mu, but it doesn't matter. And also here. Uh, this is plus one, this is minus half, this is minus half, so they cancel out exactly. Then we have this term over here and this term over here. Uh, they, they're they identical except that they come with different signs so they also cancel out. And then in the end we also have this term over here and this term over here which again come with different signs, so they cancel out. So in the end, the result is zero. So good, we have found out that if we assume that gamma is given by this formula over here, indeed the metric is, uh, the connection is torsion free. The, there is symmetry in the, these two lower indices, alpha and beta, and the covariant derivative of the metric is zero. Uh, any questions to this problem? Well, if not, let's go to the other one. Mm, I need to open my notes. Okay, so the idea was that we have the flat metric tensor. Uh, the Minkowski space. Uh, 
and we introduce a new coordinate system. Uh, okay, so I went through your notes, uh, through your solutions, and some people had problems with the, with getting the right expression in the end. There is a bit of tensor algebra and differentiation, uh, maybe a little bit too much for a problem sheet, but I don't know. Let me show you how I would approach this problem uh, and how you can make your life a bit simpler if you if you notice certain things here. Yeah, so so we are substituting the standard coordinate system, uh, which is t, x, y, z, with a new coordinate system, tau, x, y, u. Mm. Now, in order to perform the substitution, the simplest option is just to cal calculate the differentials of these two, uh, of the old uh, coordinates t and z in the terms of the new ones, because this is already something we have. Mm. So we got theta minus one over half, one minus u squared to the power of minus three, two. I'm differentiating with respect to, I differentiate with respect to tau first and now with respect to u, and there will be minus two u times tau times du. Mm. Okay, and this can be simplified to one minus u squared to the power of minus one half d tau plus, because we have two minuses, uh, one half mm, cancels out with two, so we've got u tau over, uh, or maybe let's stick to this notation over here, one minus u squared to minus three two u tau du uh, dz that's a little 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 bit more complicated so the first term is, is pretty much the same mm. And then the second one is tau du, and we need to differentiate that. Uh, okay, let's do it step by step. First, we have the derivative of, of the numerator. And this is, these are just with one minus u squared minus one half. And then the derivative of the denominator, which will be minus one half, one minus u squared to the power of minus three two times minus two u times another u. Yeah, and that's it, I think. Uh, so this is u one minus u squared to the power of minus one half e tau. And here, if you perform all possible reductions, uh, what you should get is in the end, uh, tau times one minus u squared the power of minus three two d u. Is it really the case? Yes, because you'll get plus u squared over, so this will be u squared over one plus one minus u squared to the power of three two. Uh, here you've got the denominator with one minus u squared to the power of one half. Uh, we can write it as one minus u squared divided by one minus u squared to the power of three half. And when you add these two up, this is what you end up with. 
Okay. The X and X and Y are not really touched by this transformation at all. So all we need to do is in fact calculate minus the T squared plus DZ squared. And here, what is really, okay. But before we do it, there is a simple way to simplify slightly these expressions. You can simplify them in the following way. Uh, you can write that dt is equal to one. You can factor out the powers of one minus u squared. So there is one power u squared to minus half d tau plus u tau over one minus u squared du. And dz is equal to one minus u squared to minus power one half. And what you're left will be u d tau from this one plus tau over one minus u squared du. Okay, in this form, we can calculate minus d, d squared plus dz squared. So we will have certainly one minus u squared to the power of minus one factored out. And inside here is what you get. Well, you need to square and expand each of these parentheses. From the first one, you get d tau squared plus two u tau one minus u squared d tau du plus u squared. Uh, no, this comes all with a minus. plus u squared d tau squared plus two u tau y minus u squared d tau du plus tau squared one minus u squared squared du squared. Okay, it's clear obviously that This guy cancels out with that guy. And we also have this one and this one, and this one and this one. So if you take it all together, what you get is one minus u squared to minus one. Uh, let's write it this way. This will be minus d tau squared, one minus u squared. That's the blue part. Mm, and here, what we have is plus tau squared over one minus u squared squared. And here we get one minus u squared du squared. And then obviously you can simplify this a little bit. So, the prefactor cancels out with the prefactor over here. So there's just minus one d tau squared. And here you're left with tau squared du squared over one minus u squared, because this cancels out with this one and you're left just with the denominator. So summarizing, the new metric will take the following form. Uh, we have minus d tau squared. So tau plays the role of, an, of our new time, plus dx squared plus dy squared 
and there's only one new term tau squared over oh this is squared of course over one minus u squared squared u squared that's the metric in the new coordinates mm, have you got any questions I don't hear any. In a sense, the, the, the difficult part, I think, was to perform all these differentiations correctly. And then it helps to realize that you can uh, factor out uh, one minus u squared uh, to the power of minus half in both dt and dz. And this helps a little bit with the calculations because it makes the coefficients here a little simpler to work with. And then you notice that the mixed coefficients cancel out. Uh, there are some other cancellations involved. And well, you end up in the end with a relatively simple form. OK. I will stop sharing for a second. Uh, Professor, that question has a part two, right? I mean, which part of space does? Oh, yeah, there uh, was also that question. It was, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, that's relatively simple, I think. Uh, not that many people managed to do it, but I think there was at least one correct solution to that. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, uh, I think the assumption was that tau is positive and u is any real number. Uh, let me check this over here. Yeah, tau was supposed to be positive. Yeah. Okay, so let's this one. So tau was supposed to be a positive function. You was supposed to be any real number. Which part of the space time does this coordinate system cover? Uh, let me once again write down that t is equal to one over square root one minus u squared tau z is equal to u over square root of one minus u squared. Is it correct? Oh. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing you might notice is that if you take, uh, if you divide these two numbers, uh, so let's say z over t, that's simply u. On the other hand, if you take minus t squared plus z squared, that's tau squared over one minus u squared uh, with a minus plus u squared tau squared over one minus u squared. And that's minus tau squared. Uh, is it correct? Yes, but two squared or two squared minus one. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, this is negative. This is any number. Okay, this condition that t minus t squared plus z squared is negative, that's, let's draw a picture here. Mm -hmm. that will be ct, that will be z, and let's also draw x. Y is suppressed. Uh, this defines let me 
if you just look at the TZ plane, this defines basically uh, this part of the light cone only on two on a two dimensional plane of C T and Z. Uh, however, in order to make the transformation, yes, but, but here we, we have to see that in this transformation, T is certainly a positive number. So the true uh, range of these coordinates is just this upper part of uh, this upper quadrant, uh, at least on the CTZ plane, because it's defined by this term over here together with t being positive, which follows simply from this and from the fact that tau is positive. Uh, on the other hand, there's no other restrictions because z over t, which basically gives the uh, direction over here, can take any number. Well, at least there's no restrictions here. Then what we also have, okay, and then there's also the third and fourth dimensions, but they're not, re not restricted. So these coordinates, this coordinate system is valid inside a wedge and draw it this way. wedge given by t uh, larger or equal than modulus z. This follows from this uh, t squared is larger from z squared. t is positive, so t is larger than that. So it covers this type of wedge. Is it clear? It's a question of algebraically rewriting these expressions here and no noticing that this thing here is equal to minus tau squared. It's a bit similar to what we have done with the uh, Rindler's accelerating coordinates. We also realized that uh, they cover only a wedge by pointing out that this type of uh, combination has a definite sign here. On the other hand, it can go down basically to zero or as close to zero as possible. So the whole wedge is covered. Okay, so any more questions to problem two? Okay, I don't see any, so I guess we can go back to our uh, lecture. So let me share the slides. Uh, if you are not here, there is a small correction in slide number 91. The dimension of this quantity over here is slightly different than what I had on my uh, slides during the last lecture. Um, Okay, so uh, during the last lecture, during the last few minutes, we were discussing the linearized Einstein equations. So the situation when you can formally write the equations as, uh, you can formally write the metric as a flat, uh, as the, the metric of a flat space time. So a constant minus plus 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 one matrix a diagonal matrix, plus a very small perturbation, which is also not varying very quickly. This means that the, the space-time is almost flat with small ripples of perturbations due to the matter 
or whatever else. The motivation is that this is true uh, basically in large part of the space time we observe. Uh, in this case, we can use uh, the perturbated approach. Uh, we will derive the Einstein equations as a perturbation of the flat metric, which is an obvious solution of the Einstein equations. This way, we linearize the complicated nonlinear Einstein equations, which makes them simpler to understand. Uh, also, we will make a connection to Newtonian gravity and also cover the propagation of gravitational waves. Uh, this is obviously a coordinate system dependent construction. Only in a particular chosen coordinate system or in a class of coordinate systems, uh, this splitting can be made. Because if we introduce, for example, something like polar coordinates, you will not recover, recover the standard expression for eta. So I assume that there exists a coordinate system in which we can globally use this decomposition. Uh, this metric eta is a bit of a useful mathematical tool, but the physical metric is this whole combination. Nevertheless, you will see that in the calculations, it's very often a bit simpler to think of eta as the true metric, a kind of useful fiction, and h simply as a tensor field. So we'll be back to the special relativity lecture in a sense, where the fictitious but important metric is flat, eta. And on top of that, we've got an H, which plays a role of a new tensor field on the Minkowski background. But this is just a fiction we do when we want to perform calculations. The real physical metric when we want to calculate any observables is G. In the calculations, the plan is to neglect all quadratic terms in H or DH. Uh, the coordinates in which we're looking at the system are not unique. It is possible to tweak them a little bit while keeping this form of the metric. And the goal is to impose the Einstein equations on H and find the simplest possible form of these equations. This is not that trivial. You have to simply know how to do it in order to do it effectively. Okay, we will do it on the blackboard. Okay. So linearizing Einstein equations continued. Equations. Continue. Yeah, so in a coordinate, this is a coordinate system dependent uh, construction. So I will use the green color to write the equations according to our color coding. So the metric in our particular coordinate system is g mu nu is eta mu nu, the flat one plus h mu nu of x sigma. Uh, we have already proved shown in the last lecture that the metric would be upper indices. Well, that's just eta mu nu. Formally with upper indices, but that's the same thing, but still minus h mu nu. Where here the index raising was done using the eta metric. So this is eta alpha mu beta h alpha beta. And we will mostly use the metric eta for raising and lowering indices in this coordinate system. Uh, there is a, an inherent problem you encounter when you are dealing in a situation where you have the one metric and another metric which you use for the same space time. That is, its denotation does not clearly state which metric you use for uh, lowering and raising the indices. And you have to somehow state it in, as a text. So here we will use eta for this purpose, which is not physical, Professor, but- Professor? Yes? Uh, you are not sharing the screen. Oh, thank you very much. I was not sharing the screen. Mm. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much for, for pointing this out. Uh, okay, so- yeah, so there is nothing very interesting here. It's just the metric tensor it's, it itself. 
and the inverse metric tensor. Uh, and we have shown that the expression for the inverse metric tensor is what we see here. Now the roadmap for our calculations. Uh, so what we need to do is to calculate the uh, Christoffel symbols, all the Christoffels. Then from that, we need to calculate the Riemann. Then from that, we need to calculate the Ricci tensor. And then the Ricci scalar. And from that, we will calculate the Einstein tensor. And once we have the Einstein tensor G, capital G mu nu, we can impose the Einstein equations. Using H mu nu as our variable. Then in the second step, we'll make a variable change. We'll change variables. It turns out that there is a very clever choice of variables, variables to something called H bar mu nu, which simplifies the equations, although not as much as we would like. Then we will talk a little bit about the uh, coordinate system. So we can adjust the coordinate system a little bit. It turns out that these adjustments work a little bit like gauge transforms in electromagnetism. Gauge transformation. Mm, we will impose a special gauge called Lorentz gauge or the Dunder gauge. And this way we'll arrive to simplified Einstein's equations. That's quite a lot of calculations to do, but I think that if you want to understand relativity, you have to go through this at least once in your life. So do you have any questions regarding the roadmap? The last three steps is just for the sake of simplification of the equations. Okay. Uh, since we are working in a particular coordinate system, the equations are not covariant and I will use green. Okay, so first the Christoffel symbols, it's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. Beta sigma alpha minus g alpha beta sigma. Okay, uh, so we want to provide the linear, the expression for gamma, but only at linear order. Uh, at the zero order, uh, if there is no age, gammas are all zero because we're in a flat space time where there is no non vanishing derivatives of the metric. So gamma by itself is of the order of H. It's the first linear order at least. Uh, these derivatives over here, the derivatives of the, of the full metric, since eta is constant, these derivatives are also linear in H. Simply there is no, no contribution from the derivative of eta because eta has vanishing derivatives. So this is already linear in H, all of that. But if that is so, in the inverse metric, we in fact don't need all that much 
the linear perturbation of, of, of the inverse metric because it will produce quadratic effects uh, what multiplied with this n y. So we can we can be satisfied just by plugging in the zeroth order part, namely the inverse eta. And here we get, uh, sorry, this, this should be sigma here. And here we get h alpha sigma beta plus h beta sigma alpha minus g alpha beta sigma. Now that was supposed to be h. Uh, yeah, and just to make the notation a bit more concise, we can use the, uh, so eta is compatible with standard differentiation as the covariant differentiation. So we can raise and lower the indices consistently, even in these derivatives. And we can write this thing here as H alpha mu beta plus one half H beta mu alpha minus one half H alpha beta mu. And there might be some quadratic terms we neglect. Okay. Obviously the next step will be the Riemann tensor. Mm, let me use green again. Mm, Riemann mu mu alpha beta, that's d alpha gamma mu mu beta minus d beta gamma mu mu alpha plus the quadratic terms in gammas, which I will write without the indices. And I'll write them without the indices because look, we have already seen that this is of the order of age, this thing here and also this thing here. Gammas are both of the order of h, so this is O of h squared, both of these guys. So from the point of view of our calculations, this is negligible. So we only have to focus on the derivatives of gamma terms. Okay. So here we get the derivative of one half, H, um, let's write it. Mu, mu beta plus one half H mu beta mu minus one half H uh, mu mu beta. No, that's wrong, sorry. You get H mu beta mu. And then you've got a term with alpha and beta swapped. I'll write it this way. Mm. It's very often it's very often useful in this type of calculations to notice that some terms uh, or an important part is that this is not plus but minus. It's very useful to notice that some parts of your expressions are something you already have just with some indices swapped because this saves you a lot of trouble when you perform calculations. So uh, as graduate students, you should learn all the calculation and computational tricks of tensor algebra. One of them is to notice that you can obtain some terms by an appropriate permutation of the indices. And in that case, you calculate only once and then you obtain the rest by permuting the indices. So here's what we get.
mm, minus one half h mu alpha beta minus one half h mu alpha mu beta minus plus one half h mu alpha mu beta. Okay. Uh, it's obvious that this term cancels out with that one. Let me use color here. Okay, just one remark. On the previous calculation, uh, the position of this mu index was on the second, uh, of this raised mu index was on the second uh, position here, but that doesn't really matter because this here it's on the first one, but it doesn't really matter. H is symmetric in these indices anyway. So you can swap their positions anyway. Okay, so let's summarize this equation. Uh, you can write it as one half h mu beta mu alpha minus one half h mu alpha mu beta Sorry, not with that one. Oh, damn. It cancels out with this one. Mm, yeah, and then you got minus one half. H mu beta mu alpha plus one half H mu alpha mu beta. And let me compare this with my notes. Mu alpha mu beta, mu beta mu alpha, mu alpha mu beta, mu beta mu alpha. Yeah, it's consistent with my notes. Uh, so the next step is the Ricci tensor. We perform the contraction of the index one and three, mu and alpha. And here's what we got. Uh, this is the, the, this is just partial differentiation with respect to the uh, flat metric, which is symmetric in. in uh, which is commutative. So we can swap the uh, order of these two indices with impunity and write it as H mu, mu beta mu alpha minus one half H mu 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 beta minus one half H mu beta mu mu plus one half h mu 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 beta. Uh, this thing over here, we can write it as minus dt squared of h mu alpha plus the Laplacian of H, so H mu beta plus the Laplacian of H mu beta. 
And this is sometimes written as the wave or the box operator H nu beta. The box is simply minus the T squared plus Laplacian. Okay, and that's the Ricci answer. Yeah, and I think it's a good moment for a break. Uh, do you have any questions before the break? I don't see any, so let me, so let's make a break until seven minutes past 10. Uh, Professor, I had a question. Uh, with respect to problem sheet four, actually. Yes, we have a few minutes. We, we can talk about that. Let yeah. me go to the pro problem sheet four. Uh, no, I don't think so. You have to go to problem sheet four. It's okay. The only question is that when we are calculating the Rishi tensor, uh, mm -hmm. so or rather the Riemann tensor, uh, Riemann uh, curvature tensor, at that time, do we have to calculate all the terms of the Riemann curvature or can we just calculate the ones which are needed just for the Rishi tensor? Uh, in case of problem four, it's happening in two dimensions, so there isn't that many. Yes, I agree. There isn't that much to calculate. In fact, there is only one single component to calculate anyway. But in yeah. general, uh, okay, it depends on on the problem. If there is nothing else to do in this in a particular problem, then calculate the Ricci because you want to impose the Einstein equations. Then indeed, it may happen that you don't need some of the uh, components, but but. Okay, the problem is that this, you cannot, well, yeah. okay, if you just want to calculate the Ricci tensor, then indeed some components of the Riemann are not that necessary. Yeah. And it happen that you don't need them. But in, in case of, the, of, of problem four, I think there isn't that much to calculate and all the components you can calculate uh, are needed. Okay, okay. Okay, and uh, given the scenario, uh, we can always assume that R mu nu equals to R nu mu, right? Uh, or, yes. Uh, yes, the Ricci tensor is always symmetric. Symmetric, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, very well. So it's already seven minutes past 10. I think we can go back to our lecture. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay, everything works, very good. So we already have the Ricci tensor expressed using H, and it's just a random combination of contractions of the second derivatives of H. Let's calculate the Ricci tensor. So again, the Ricci is of the order of H. In order to calculate the Ricci scale, scalar, we strictly speaking need the inverse metric tensor times the Ricci tensor. But since this is of the order of age, it's absolutely enough to substitute the plus eta mu nu here because the difference will be of the order of h squared anyway. So what we effectively need to do is to contract everything with respect to nu and beta. Oh, there is a mistake here. Yeah, I'm making too many mistakes today. I don't know why. So we perform the contraction with respect to mu and uh, mu and beta, and we obtain one half h. Let's say mu 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 minus one half h mu 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 minus the same thing effectively h mu 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 plus again term of the type of mu 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 uh, term one is identical to term, term four and term, term two is identical to term three so we can write them as this h mu Mu, mu, mu minus h mu mu the trace of h mu mu 
and strictly speaking, it's box. Okay, so we're done with that. Next step is the Einstein tensor. The Einstein tensor. Uh, yeah, so the general expression, as you remember, is that we take r mu mu minus one half to the scalar g mu mu. Again, Riemann and Ricci are of the order of age, that there are linear quantities in age. So it's enough to use the zero order for g. So this is for all practical purposes, equal to r mu nu minus one half, which is scalar eta mu nu, plus quadratic terms we neglect. Mm. Okay. And it's a problem of basically writing the same thing again. So first we have this type of one half age. Let's write it this way. Alpha mu, alpha mu, uh, plus one half age alpha mu, alpha mu. Yeah, and there's two more terms here. Yeah, that's correct. And now we need to subtract one half H, say alpha beta, alpha beta minus H, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, eta, mu, nu. That's the Einstein tensor. And the Einstein equations are, of course, g mu nu equals to 8 pi g t mu nu. And the problem is that in this form, these equations don't look very enlightening. It, it looks more like a random combination of second derivatives of age, and it's difficult to make any sense out of that. So we have to clean this, up this equation, and this is there is a well-known way to do it. Uh, a bit tedious, but not that difficult. And the first step is substituting a new variable. So things will clean up a little bit if instead of h mu nu, we use h bar mu nu, defined as s h mu nu minus one half h sigma sigma eta mu nu. The contraction here is performed using eta, of course. Uh, this is known as the trace reverse of H. Uh, why is it known this way? Well, if you calculate the trace H bar alpha alpha, this is just H alpha alpha minus, the trace of the metric is four times minus four, this is minus two H sigma sigma, which is minus the trace of H. So the tensors, uh, any symmetric tensor can be written down as a traceless contribution plus the trace. And here, H bar has the same traceless part as H, but it has a different trace, namely the trace is minus the trace of H. You can then apply this trace reverse to H bar and go back to H. So in this case, H mu nu is simply H bar mu nu minus one half h bar alpha alpha eta mu nu. This is, by the way, exactly the same relation we have between the Einstein tensor and the Ricci tensor. They are the trace reverse of each other. Although 
I'm not sure if there's any relation between these facts. At the moment, treat this simply as a clever substitution. We're using a different variable to make things a bit simpler. And while well, we have to calculate term by term uh, what these things actually mean. So we have the term age alpha mu, alpha mu. This term involves some kind of divergence of age, once more differentiated by, by mu. And this is obviously age alpha mu, alpha mu minus one half. H bar sigma sigma. I rename this index because we've got alphas and betas for, for a different purpose. Mm. Then instead of uh, a instead of eta delta mu, we have here delta delta alpha mu because the, the index is raised. And then this is differentiated with respect to. Uh, alpha and the mu. So this is, in other words, H alpha mu. So we have to raise the index here in this formula. This produces the raised index H, but also the raised index eta, which is just delta uh, mu nu. And this is the delta which comes up here. We also have differentiations with respect to alpha and mu, which hits only this part. So in the end, we got this minus one half h bar sigma sigma mu nu. Okay, then we have terms of type h alpha alpha mu nu, but that's simple. Uh, we know that the trace of h is minus the trace of h bar, so this is minus trace of h bar alpha alpha Union. So we are done with this term and this term. They're, they're of this type. And now we have this term. We are left with that one. Mm. Yeah, so H mu nu alpha alpha. What's that? That's H bar mu nu alpha alpha. <laughs> and then we have to act with this box operator on, on this thing here. It, add, it acts only on h bar, so we get h sigma sigma alpha alpha mu nu. Mm, yeah, that's this type of thing. And we also have H alpha beta alpha beta, which is H bar alpha beta alpha beta minus one half H bar sigma sigma alpha beta eta alpha beta. And that's simply H bar alpha beta alpha beta minus one half H sigma sigma alpha alpha. Oof. And the last term is H alpha alpha beta beta. Mm. Beta beta. Uh, minus one half h bar sigma sigma. Then we have to take the trace with respect to that, which produces four. Oh, and this is defined, I have to do it this way. This needs to be differentiated by beta beta. And there's here this uh, delta alpha alpha which gives four 
so this will be minus h bar alpha alpha beta beta. We could have noticed that before because h alpha alpha is minus h bar alpha alpha. So that's a bit of a complicated thing. Okay. Now it's time for our substitution. Okay, I will not do it step by step because that's a little boring, but if you perform everything correct, the answer in the end you get should be one half H bar alpha mu mu alpha plus one half H bar alpha mu mu alpha. minus one half the box operator acting on h bar mu nu minus one half h bar alpha beta alpha beta. Uh, I haven't shown that when you perform the substitution this is indeed what you get but uh, that's a bit long and not very enlightening. And also rather, rather simple. It's just a question of taking the expression over here and substituting each of these terms and then cleaning up the, the resulting equation. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still a combination of derivatives, but no, notice something very interesting. If we somehow manage to impose the condition that h bar alpha mu alpha is equal to zero, so if we manage to impose the condition that h bar alpha mu alpha is equal to zero, then, then what happens? This guy vanishes, this guy vanishes, this guy vanishes, and we're left just with one term. And moreover, this one term has a very nice form. It's basically the box, the wave operator acting on our h bar component by component. And this will turn this will turn the Einstein equations into a wave equation. And wave equation is something we know very well from the course of electromagnetism. We know how, how to solve it. It can be solved using the Green's function, for example, uh, or there are other methods to do it. We know what the properties of this equations, equation are. So it would be very nice if we could somehow manage to get rid of all these terms by imposing this condition over here. But can we really do it? Because in principle, uh, H is arbitrary. Therefore, h bar is also arbitrary, and we cannot make sure that this is true. However, there is some room for maneuver left. Namely, we can adjust the coordinate system. OK, so we are working in a coordinate system in which this is true with the with h being much smaller than one. What can you do to the coordinate system uh, without changing this 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 condition? Well, you can certainly do Lorentz transforms. So you can take x alpha to some kind of lambda beta prime alpha x alpha plus maybe some constant c beta prime and that will be equal to our new alpha and that's just a Lorentz transform it will transform the uh, h bar and h as appropriate tensors it will not touch the form of the metric eta so we will be fine our new h will be just a, a boosted or Lorentz transform ver version of standard h if the former were, were very small, so will the latter. 
but this is not the only adjustment you can make. There is another one, namely, we can fix a vector field, a small vector field, let's call it Xi A, and define our new coordinate system, Y alpha prime, to be X alpha plus Xi alpha of X, of X sigma. And we assume that this is very small. It should be of the order of H. So this is a kind of tiny adjustment of the coordinate system. We got the coordinate system in which the metric is almost flat, but we fix a vector field Xi at every point, a kind of tiny ve vectors here and there. And this way we obtain a different coordinate system, slightly, let's say slightly updated. You see, it's not terribly different from the one we had before, but it has been adjusted a little bit. Now, this is perfectly admissible. And this is admissible because see what happens when we perform the uh, this coordinate transformation. In that case, G mu nu transforms into G mu prime mu prime equals to G mu nu lambda mu mu prime lambda nu mu prime, with these guys being basically the appropriate derivatives. So we need to calculate first lambda mu prime mu goes to dy mu prime over dx mu. So we've got delta first, because we're differentiating x alpha with respect to x alpha. Plus, and we'll have the derivative of psi mu prime component by component in the direction of mu. And the inverse of that, it's easy to check, is, sorry, the inverse of that is delta mu mu prime minus psi mu mu prime. So after our coordinate transform, plus possibly quadratic terms in psi, but psi is of the order of h, we can safely neglect any kind of spurs. And you can check by direct com computation that if you multiply this matrix by that matrix, you'll get a unit matrix. So this is a very good approximation of this inverse here. Do you have any question to this? Okay, I don't hear any. So what we get is G mu nu multiplied by delta mu mu prime minus psi mu mu prime delta mu psi is of the order of h it's very important delta mu mu prime minus psi mu mu prime now we have to use the expression for h for g Okay, uh, we multiply uh, and Professor, expand. I had a question. Yes. Uh, so when you say that xi has to be of the order of h, it means yes. that it has to be an order of linear of h? Or... Yes, yes. We assume that it's of the same order in the sense that, uh, yeah. So yeah, right? pretty it, much. It has to be in order. linear order, right? Yes. Okay. So basically we, we assume that we can easily neglect things of the order of xi squared or psi multiplying h, or the derivatives. Okay. okay. Okay, so now multiplying everything here, we get, and expanding the, the, these terms, we get eta mu prime mu, mu prime. Uh, then we have 
eta mu prime mu prime, uh, sorry, h mu prime mu prime, the first order term, and then we have more first order terms. So eta multiplying psi, and we get from this new mu prime minus psi mu mu prime. And then there might be products of psi with psi or psi with, with h, but they're negligible. Okay. And now look. In these new coordinates, we still have the flat metric eta mu nu. Uh, okay, strictly speaking, this was this, this plus that, this used to be the flat metric in old coordinates, but expressed in new coordinates. But we may look at this formula a bit differently. We may simply state that this is the flat metric in new coordinates, this thing over here. This is of the order of h. These derivatives are also the order of, order of h, so they're small. So we can call it our new h. Um, what do I use for that? Oh, so we can call all of that our new age, and this makes sense because it's the, in this new coordinate system we still have uh, a flat constant term plus something small, except that this new thing, this small age, is not what used to be age. It's not the same thing. There is a contribution from these vectors psi. Uh, so we can write that h mu nu transforms it to h mu mu prime mu prime y equals to h mu nu minus psi mu nu minus psi mu nu. Uh, yeah, I'm using primes here, but it doesn't really matter. These are not covariant equations. So uh, the, the distinguishing between prime and unprime indices is a bit of, of, of a question of convention. Okay, so we know that after this type of coordinate readjustment, H transforms this way. This is very much a reminder of the electromagnetic theory where you can, you know that you can perform a gauge transformation of the four potential by adding a total derivative of a function. Here you add a symmetrized total derivative of a vector. That's why these type of transforms are also known as the gauge transforms. And the idea is to use this gauge transform to make sure that this condition over here is satisfied. So even if somebody gives us a metric with a perturbation which doesn't, whose trace re reverse doesn't satisfy that, we can respond by a small readjustment of coordinates, which changes, which doesn't change physics at all, but after which this condition is satisfied. We will now see that this is possible. Any questions? Okay, if not, then let's go to the next slide. So let's see what happens with a h bar after this transformation. Uh, so h bar tilde mu prime mu prime, that's basically h tilde mu prime mu prime minus one half h bar sigma prime sigma prime eta mu prime mu prime, uh, which is h mu mu minus one minus psi mu mu minus psi mu mu minus one half h sigma sigma minus psi sigma sigma and there's two terms of this kind so we're taking the uh, we are raising the one of the indices and taking the trace, so this is what we get. 
and this is times eta mu mu. So these two guys, this one and that one, uh, they will combine to H bar. Mm, and on top of that, we got minus psi mu nu, minus psi mu nu, uh, minus psi sigma, sigma eta mu nu. Plus, sorry, because there's a minus here and a minus here, so it's plus. Okay, so we know how the uh, trace reverse of H transforms under the gauge transformations. Uh, now, what is happening with the with this thing here? So, the divergence of that. Well, it transforms into mu prime mu prime, which is H bar mu 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 minus psi mu 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 minus psi mu 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 plus psi sigma sigma mu eta mu mu and that's h bar mu 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 now this is in other words psi sigma differentiated by sigma and mu and that's the same thing as here but with a different sign so these two guys let me use this color this guy here and this guy here, they cancel out. And because of that, we are left with this minus psi mu, mu component, mu, mu. And that's just the box operator acting on the components of Xi. Yes. Okay. Uh, so imagine somebody gives us a perturbation for which H bar mu nu mu is not equal to zero. What do we do? Well, we respond by writing down this equation over here. This is the wave equation. We write the wave equation for four components uh, of the tensor. Now let me go back to the notation I had before. Uh, let this be we write the equation that this is box is supposed to be equal to this divergence over here. This can always be solved because we know from the theory of the, of the wave equation that we can use the Green's function formalism, integrate with the sources. Uh, so using this as a source, we can obtain uh, uh, a solution of oxy mu. It's not unique, by the way. You can always add a plane wave or other thing solutions here. But certainly there are always solutions for any right-hand side here. And if we do it, then we can, uh, we can then use this Xi, perform the gauge transform with Xi, gauge transformation, H mu nu into H mu nu minus Xi mu, mu minus Xi mu mu. And after that, our new h bar mu mu mu. Well, that's going to be the old 
uh, bar mu nu minus uh, box xi nu, but we have designed things exactly for these two terms to cancel. So this is zero. So we have proven that for any uh, perturbations we get, we can respond by calculating, solving the wave equations and calculating four components of the vector psi, which are indeed of the order of H, performing an appropriate gauge transform. And after this gauge transform, uh, everything is as it used to be, except that this age here, uh, the, the, the new age bar is divergence free. Have you got any questions? Okay, if not, then this condition here, this is known as the Lorentz gauge. Condition, or sometimes dead on their gauge condition. Uh, fun fact, the Lorentz who, who defined this condition is not the famous Lorentz. It's, it's a different Lorentz, according to at least one relatively textbook, and I never realized that. But it was also independently discovered by the Donder. Now, what's the advantage of this procedure? Well, as we noticed, now in the new gauge, the Einstein equations take the form of, let's go back to here. This vanishes, this vanishes, this vanishes, minus half box H bar mu nu. This is equal to eight pi G e mu nu, or box acting on each component of H bar mu nu, that's minus 16 P G P U U. And that's the form I wanted to advertise. This is the form you should remember. It's, so it turns out that after linearization, the Einstein equations just amount to a bunch of wave equations, in, in practice, 10 wave equations for each component of the symmetric tensor H bar. And the source is the stress energy tensor. Yeah, that's very nice because a wave, wave equation is something mathematical physics understands very well. So we should be fine with this form of the Einstein equations. It's much more clear than the one we obtained initially. Okay. We have 15 more minutes. Let me go back to the yellow color. Uh, let's look at a special case. So let's assume that the sources of the gravitational field move with very small velocities. B much smaller than C, that the pressures are small in comparison to energy density, Here C is as in one. And in that case, we may look at the stress energy tensor again. Let's say T mu nu. 
And it's fairly obvious that in that case, it will be dominated entirely by the zero zero component, the energy density, because any kind of pressures or effects of motions will be strongly suppressed either, either by the fact that pressure is much smaller than rho or by the fact that the velocity is much smaller than C. So the effective mass transfer rho times V over C will be much smaller than rho. So in most physical situations, because, because in most physical situations, this is true, the stress energy tensor is in fact dominated by zero zero component, which is the energy density in a particular frame. Note, this is true in a particular frame. So the tacit assumption is that there is a frame uh, in which, first of all, the physical metric is the flat metric plus small perturbations. And in this, and in, and in this decomposition, we can find a frame in which all motions of the sources are non-relativistic and pressures are small. If we can do it, then the stress energy tensor is basically dominated by the T00 component. And all we need to solve for is this equation for the 0, 0 component. Now, if all motions are very slow, then we can assume quasi-static approximations. So, uh, okay, let's write the equation first. So we have that nabla h0,0 bar is equal to minus 16 eg. Uh, let's call h bar zero zero minus four phi, just for fun. In this case, the same equation can be written as box phi equal to four phi g rho. All other equations are satisfied automatically because there is, we can safely assume that all other h bar Terms. So h bar oj, h bar ij, they're all equal to zero. The only non-trivial part is h0, zero, and satisfies this equation over here. Now assume that because of the motions are very slow, phi is effectively only a function of position, and there's any dependence on time is subdominant to the variations of, of position. And in that case, we can neglect the time derivative here and the box operator turns simply into the Laplacian. Aha, uh -huh. we recover the Poisson equation for the only relevant function in this perturbed metric. And that's very nice. So let's now try to figure out what the metric looks like. This looks very much like Newtonian physics, but we're not quite there yet. So let's go back to the metric itself. That's h bar mu nu minus one half h sigma sigma bar eta mu nu, which is in the matrix notation minus four phi, zero, 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 and zeros off the diagonal, minus uh, okay. Uh, the trace of this guy is minus this guy plus this guy plus this guy plus this guy. This is four phi. We're taking half of this, so this is two phi. And here we got uh, the eta. So that's minus two phi, minus two phi, minus two phi, minus two phi. Okay, so this is minus two phi times the unit matrix. So the G mu nu, which is 
tau. You, you, we are go back to the we go back to the physical metric in order to to understand the physics of of the solution. Well, that's going to be in the diagonal form minus one minus two phi, one minus two phi, one minus two phi, one minus two phi, zero zero. So the metric is minus dt squared one plus two phi plus one minus two phi dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. We have already encountered this metric uh, during this lecture. It was one of the examples we were solving. Uh, basically, we solved for the Christoffel symbols in this uh, metric. And we also managed to show that for a massive particle, the equation of motion is xi double dot is equal to minus phi i, which is basically the Newton's equation for a particle in potential phi. And that's excellent. It means that the Newtonian approximation works. Massive particles uh, with non-relativistic velocities with respect to the frame we're looking at, uh, behave exactly like they used to in, in uh, as they're supposed to in, in Newtonian approximation. And on top of that, the potential phi satisfies the Poisson equation of Newtonian gravity. So we have recovered the Newtonian approximation. We have also justified, in the meantime, uh, the prefactor 8 pi g in the Einstein equations. Uh, had we chosen a different prefactor over here, we would get a different factor in this Poisson equation. On the other hand, the equation of motion would still look like minus phi, uh, minus the gradient of phi gives the acceleration. So we would have the inconsistency with the Newtonian limit. We know from Newtonian physics that this is this holds fairly well in the solar system with four pi g, and this is only uh, and this only works if we assume eight pi g in the full Einstein equations. So we have justified the choice of the. Uh, of the uh, constant here in the Einstein equations being a pi g. Do you have questions here? Uh, I do. Yes, please. So, so first thing is that um, this is a special case, right? It's a very special case. Yes. We assume quite a lot here. Yes, but the thing is that in most of the scenarios when we are using Newtonian equation, it fits fairly well with a, uh, with a given scenario that it's a smaller system, right? Mm, it works very well within the conditions I have specified. So the sources should have relatively small pressures uh, in comparison yes. to their, ma their masses. And this is true for basically all the matter we see around us, perhaps with the, with the exception of uh, neutron stars or cosmological constant. Yes. Uh, also, the motions are supposed to be non-relativistic, and in the solar system, the molars are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in that case, yeah, so this it, is, exactly. Okay. So this scenario is more or less a bit more on the generalized aspect, right? Yes. It should work with relatively good approximation in most cases. Yeah. And uh, so, so this is. Like this is this is a very random question actually. So uh, when we are calculating the motion with respect to let's say uh, let's assume that it's Mercury's orbit itself, and then we see that there is some form of precession, which of this condition is not fulfilled so that we have uh, these kinds of perturbations? You mean you mean the precession of Mercury? Yes. Uh, everything is satisfied except that uh, you have to go to the second order to see this effect. So oh, okay. what is not satisfied? Uh, in terms of, let me go here.
it's not a random question it's a good question in terms of uh, so so for a massive body pi is of the order of gm over the distance from from the center of this body uh, and for the sum this is a small number 10 to minus i think 7 however in order to get the full equations you have to also consider fx which of the order of phi squared phi to the power of 3 or in higher powers of gm over r and on top of that, you also need to consider effects which are of the higher powers in the orbital velocity over C. If you include them consistently, you will get the perihelion precession of Mercury. We will do it on this during this lecture. So within this approximation, in linear theory, there would be no precession. Uh, you have to go beyond this approximation to see it. On the other hand, you can already guess that the precession of Mercury will be very small because it's obviously a quadratic effect here. It's an additional thing to the Newtonian physics we know. Uh, okay, but uh, then when we are considering phi squared or phi cubed, at that time we can't have this condition itself, right, where the perturbation is very small because now the quadratic terms are being uh, like introduced. Yes, and we will deal with uh, when discussing the perturbation of, uh, when discussing the uh, Mercury uh, orbital precession, we will in fact use uh, an exact solution of the Einstein equations instead of this approximation. We'll use the Schwarzschild metric exactly for this reason. You have to go beyond this uh, simplified description. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, the next topic would be, will be queuing vectors and then later uh, a deeper look into the equations of motion, conservation laws, and the effects on light propagation in this uh, perturbed metric. But I think it's the right time to, to wrap up the lecture because we have just have two minutes. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.